Welcome everybody to the Ring the Bell podcast. We're still in the spring training edition, but not so long. That's Heath Bell. That's Nick Kreider. Gentlemen, happy Friday. Hey, it's good to be Friday, man. The weekend started today. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Another day, another dollar. Yeah, man. It's uh I can't wait. We've already we're gonna talk a little bit about spring training. We already have some storylines, some injury news, some big extension news and all that stuff. I'd say first off and foremost, it's you know good to hear from everybody. And this Padre team, this offense is looking pretty, pretty lethal just early in the spring training. I know I was watching one game, they had 14 runs and like three, four innings. It was ridiculous. So I'm not gonna get used to that, but I, I have a feeling we may be a little bit spoiled this year. Well, yeah. here's the thing in spring training. Guys, I've, I've been watching guys, and they, they their swings are good. But what I think what's most confident about the team and what I love seeing about the team is everybody's confident about this year. It's almost like, you know, there's only one or two jobs to win. Everybody kind of knows their role. They're going out there. They're confident. They're getting doing what they need to do, get ready for the season. And you can just see the confidence. It's not like everybody's ready. It's just that confidence is building out into point. base hits and getting people out. So. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying, when, when guys like, obviously, Soto, who is hitting a whopping 727 to start spring training, you know, and even Machado out here hitting 429, right? If, if guys have a spring training like this, obviously, he's not going to hit 700 for the full spring training. But let's say he hovers around 500 all spring training long. Heath, I mean, as a ball player, like, how much of that leaks into the regular season? Because I've definitely seen it at times where guys have an amazing spring and then they completely drop off as soon as day one hits in in regular play. Well, here's the thing. The last week of the season is really – maybe the last 10 days is where all the pitchers, we're really trying to get you out. The mm -hmm. first, couple, first two weeks of spring, we're working on like, hey, I want to work on my pitch over here or I want to work on my breaking ball or I want to throw inside more. I want to really execute this. And then you got some young guys trying to make the team. So you got the veteran guys kind of knowing what we're going to throw because you see him, me warm up with just fastballs on one side of the plate. Well, I'm trying to work on that. So, you know, you kind of see it. So I'm not looking. I mean, the bad averages are up because we have superstars on our team. And when you have multiple superstars, they feed off each other. And I think they're doing really well there. But the true test is going to be in about two weeks to kind of see is their bad average kind of drop that last week. And it would go from like 700 to like 590 where everybody will be like, he hit 600. No, it kind of dropped when things got serious. So really, right. I think the last 10 days, their last – a bats in the last 10 days if we could have a batting average just there we'll kind of tell tell guys going good into the season or like have you seen it before nick where somebody's hitting 700 finishes <laughs> out 600 or 590 in the end of end of spring and you're like he had amazing spring but literally he hadn't he had one hit in the last two weeks and then the season started right so, yeah. you know it, it's you got to look at the pitchers too i mean and also arizona the ball carries you a fly ball. Yeah, the ball yeah. is going to go out. Out in Florida, the spring training out there, the ball doesn't carry as much. So you kind of see batting average lower, and you can kind of tell what, um, you know, guys are truly going to hit. So, you know, but I like, I mean, you're hitting 700, you're hitting 800. That's yeah, nice. You're yeah. going <laughs> to hit 300 during the season. So, and I, I'm, I'm excited about Soto. I think he's wait, watching him play. He's at a contract year, and a lot of guys at contract years really focus, especially, you know, he's with the new team, but he pretty much had a, half a season with us, kind of kind of enough to be a Padre. And now he's back, and he's really comfortable with San Diego. So, um, I And think, no shift. Remember, no shift. And that's well, the thing, because a lot of his There's no hits. shift, but did you guys happen to see the Twins game? Against Gallo? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the left fielder move over. But you're, I mean, you're, you're not going to do that for Soto, though. Well, a lot of Soto's I, hits in the spring, too, have kind of went up that gap where he got screwed last year when it comes to the shift. So I think – I, I, go ahead. I'm just going to say, I bet you teams are going to do that. Sure. So hit the, learn to hit the ball the other way, guys. There's ways, the people won't shift on you. There's ways to work around anything. But as always, everyone, make sure you guys go check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your listen, um, you know, at the Ring, uh, Ring the Bell podcast. You know, give, give us a review. Hopefully five stars. Leave a comment, and let's get up these uh, podcast billboards. And I know Heath was mentioning about things getting serious. Maybe not for the Padres yet in spring training, but for Manny Machado and, and Peter Seiler and this organization. Listen, we – 
there was inclination at first when we were recording that there was going to be some issues with this contract. And then over the next few days, they were saying, you know, talks had reengaged. And next thing you know, Manny Machado's a San Diego Padre for life. 11-year, $350 million extension. That's, that's, that's awesome news to hear. But even better, Machado, if you take a look at that contract, is only taking $13 million a year for the first three years of that deal and then bumps up a little bit to 21, then 26. A big chunk of that is his signing bonus at $45 million that's sprinkled over the 11 years. So what does that show us? The Padres are continually manipulating the CBT so guys like Juan Soto can get taken care of and others next. I'll start with you, Nick. What does this contract just show you about this ownership and their willingness to not even be close to being done? Well, first off, it's old news now, right? We've moved on yeah. from this. I mean, this happened on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, obviously, I'm super excited, and um, I'm so happy that Manny decided to be a Padre for life. I think one of the big quotes that I took away from that was him saying, I want to go in the Hall of Fame with that San Diego logo on my cap. So that meant a lot to him, right? Build the statue down at Peco Park right next to Tony Gwynn and Trevor Hoffman, and, you know, let's call it a day. But yeah, I like what Peter Seidler and, and AJ are doing with the um, with the contract manipulation a little bit and manipulation in a good way in terms of being able to spend more money. And look, by all accounts, every single baseball writer that's out there right now says the Padres aren't done, right? They still got Soto to potentially extend. They still have Otani to potentially go after. There's talks that they want to bring back Hater. So, you know, Machado... In a way, he is being selfless, right? Not taking all of the change right up front and and making it doable for the rest of the team to yeah. be competitive for years to come. And I think that's a very, you know, veteran move out of him that that just talks about his leadership. And, you know, it's it's it just goes to show you that this team really wants to build a dynasty for the next 10 years. Yeah, the Seidler family, man. They got good accountants. They know how to work the books. They know how to work the money and shift it over here. Like, hey, we'll give you the three hundred million or whatever it is. You know, you know. Really, when you make over a hundred million, it's all the same. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, I'm freaking jealous of him. But it's one of those things that they're moving the money around, and Machado is, you know, mature enough to be like, hey, I'm going to get all that money. It doesn't matter. It's eleven years. I'll get all of it by the end of the time. So. I think Machado has showed a lot of maturity in this. The Seidler family showed we want to spend money, but we know how to do it correctly. We know how to move money around, shift it around, because we have a lot of future stars here in San Diego, and we want to keep them all. That's what that tells me right there. So yeah, it's exciting, and also I'm freaking jealous right now. We're playing <laughs> this, on this team. The, the crazy thing, though, is as we were talking about, and this this kind of leads me into our next segment of Peter Seidler. I say Seidler's our savior. It's the Padres aren't done, and that's the crazy thing. Right as this Machado deal goes down, Bob Nightingale, others report that the Padres are now willing to are looking to kind of finalize the Juan Soto extension, and will be all in on Shohei Otani next year. There's no way, right? They're going to get both of those guys, but but then again, we continue to doubt them, and and they just they just continue to to dish out this money, dish out this money. And when you're taking a look at some of these pay cuts, right? Darvish is taking a little bit less on an AAV now. Machado is taking a lot less. They're actually under the CBT, and they're still looking to add. So it's it's pretty insane. And as Nick says, positive manipulation of what they're doing. And by giving these longer longer term deals with AAV a little bit less, it allows for inflation to kick in. The CBT continuously going up. They know what they're doing. But how much do you buy into that? This team is going to look to extend Soto, Hater. Get Otani. I mean, Heath, do, do you buy into all of that? I'm buying into it for the simple fact they went out and got Soto last year and they got Machado's deal done be basically before spring training was over. Very halfway through spring training, you know, last week. That's an organization that wants to get things done. They don't want it to drag along like, you know, the Yankees did with Aaron Judge, you know. We all knew Aaron Judge was going to be a Yankee for the you know rest of his career. I mean, we all speculate. It's like Derek Jeter. We all knew he was going to stay there, you know, Poppy, blah, blah, blah. But it was one of those things that, you know, Kershaw, but they, everybody took it towards the end, you know, where San Diego's basically got with Machado's agent and said, hey, let's get a deal done. Let's go. They never stopped and they didn't went, well, let's see how you play this year. That probably, I mean, I was saying a couple weeks ago, they'll probably see how he plays. And if he doesn't play as well, maybe they can save some money. Yeah. But they said, screw that. They threw it on the table and said, what What can we do to make this deal done? We want it done. Let's go. So I'm buying into, they're going after everybody. Yeah, I'm completely with you on that. 
And it's funny because I think if you look across the league, we're the team nowadays that other fans are jealous of. Mm -hmm. They're jealous of our ownership because the ownership is rewarding their players and rewarding their fans, right? If they say they want to go in on someone, they make it happen. You know, they're delivering on their promises, and that's something we're not used to as Padres fans, right? We've we've danced around a bunch of guys in the past that we've missed out on because we were being too cheap or, you know, we wanted to manipulate contracts or Morad, whatever. John that Moore. Yeah, hey, exactly. I want to play for the Sidlers, man. Adrian Gonzalez, that. that was a tough one. It's a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just bad ownership. Now we have good owners. We have owners that like baseball. They want the team to do well, and but, they know what they're doing. But Heath, the majority of these, let's be real, the majority of these, quote, mid to small market owners are still pretty bad, right? They're still pocketing all this money for themselves. It's not like there's been a huge paradigm shift. I know Steve Cohen with the Mets, but that's New York, and that's a guy with a $16 billion net worth. There's a lot of owners who have more money than Peter Seidler, but he's like, listen, I'm getting older. I've had some illnesses. I want to see this thing. I want, I want to see this in my life. And I don't think well, a lot, not, no owners have that Dick Monfort of the Rockies. Yeah. How you doing? You know, the only other owner that had that was the Steinbrenners. Yeah. Stein, you know, Steinbrenner, basically all the other owners were mad because he's like, you know what? I'm going to spend 80% of what I make into this team. Cause if I, if I keep 20%, I'm still freaking rich. Right. You know, you know it's one of those things. Like if still I'm a billionaire, billionaire. <laughs> if I'm a billionaire and I spend, you know, let's just say half a billion on a team. I still have half a billion dollars. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's one of those things. And I think Seidler realized that and Steinbrenner realized he took a team that everybody knows the Yankee hat right now. And I guarantee you, everybody's starting to know the San Diego hat right now. Everybody across the country is starting to realize SD is, you know, San Diego Padres, not South Dakota. <laughs> so it's one of those things that he, Long term, you're gonna make the money down the road easily, but you mm -hmm. gotta. He's the old school. The Sidlers are old school, like I am. You have to spend money to make money, and look how much everybody's talking about us winning the World Series. Everybody's talking about, well, we're gonna go after everybody. Why would not Otani want to come here if Soto signs sometime this year, dude? I want to go there. Look at all these people that are locked up long term. I want to go there and play because right. they have a chance of winning every year. They're gonna have a chance. Of winning, putting a ring on their finger and winning a World Series. And it's not just going to be like, well, we just built for this year or next year, like the Cubs did a couple years ago and some other teams. You know, I hate to say it, but we're going to be like the Houston Astros, but in the National League, the team that's the team to beat every single year. That'd be awesome. I'll take that. I'll take that every day, all day. And you bring up a good point, Born, about the illnesses that Sadler has overcome in his life. And I've been saying it for, for you know, a couple of years now that like, this guy has has cheated death, you know, like he he overcame cancer and, you know, there's certain situations that that make you kind of a different person. A new perspective, a yeah. new perspective. Right. And you can't take that money with you to the grave. So why not build a legacy in San Diego, build a dynasty here, right? Leave your mark on the community. You can go down as one of the greatest San Diegans of all time if he brings multiple World Series to, to San Diego. So I really believe in what he's doing and what you know, the franchise is doing and it means a lot as a fan, you know, especially since we've we've endured so much pain from this organization from so many years. But what I also think is interesting and obviously it's good is all, all the guys that we're locking up here for 10 year deals, 11 year deals, they're all proven guys. It's not like we're going out and taking a guy who had one good year, two good seasons, right? Manny Machado is a perennial all star candidate. You know, future Hall of Famer. Future Hall of Famer. Bogarts is a batting title champion year in, year out, and all star at shortstop. You know, Tatis obviously is the young phenom. Soto's the guy that, you know, like all these guys are are proven superstars. It's not like, you know, back in the day when we're like, all right, Hosmer had one over 300 season and, you know, we're going to throw him a boatload of money. <laughs> like, that's just, that's yeah. just not how we're doing things anymore. Yeah. You know? James Shields, you know, one great season. Here's a five year, you know, $70 million contract. He got us Tatis forever grateful. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I totally understand your point, Nick. And and I think the one thing we're starting to learn about Peter Seidler is when he first started getting more involved with the team over Ron Fowler, we knew he wanted to win. But but now we've started to learn that he wants to maintain a winning culture. He doesn't just want to win for a few years. He wants to maintain it, a sustained, Dominance. successful product. And I know they haven't reached the mountaintop yet, but all these contracts, what is it telling us? That they are going to be in the conversation every single year. And going back to October, he said, quote, I kind of like spending money. You can't take it with you. 
As, scared as, money as, don't make money. Scared money don't make money. And like as as shallow of a concept that is, there are like no owners besides th- one, on one hand I can count who have that mindset. So um, I, I I think it's fantastic. I, I think uh, you're, the, fans, we're you're in good hands. We're lucky. We're lucky. We got a, we got a good one. Let, let's segue really quick. I, I know it's, it's tough to transition to this one. Let's go back to the team side of things, though. Uh, Juan Soto, at the time of recording this video, as well as miss, missing the Friday night matchup against the L.A. Dodgers. He's been scratched a few times with left calf tightness. I know he's having a fantastic spring, and Bob Melvin even said, I know it's not affecting his swing, but let's talk about, you know, not necessarily injury, but as a Padre fan, let's be real, the Padres are way more important than Team Dominican Republic and the WBC. With that event coming up, are there concerns about Soto's injury that this thing can linger on? Because it's been a few weeks now that they're reporting this. I think we you can definitely worry about it. It's just one of those things that I think we're going to be – we might send somebody during the World Baseball Classic to watch Soto, and he might not even know. It's one of those things. I played in the World Baseball Classic, and I think it was the second year I was there. David Wright had a little back issue that they kind of did, and he was killing it for us. Mm -hmm. The first round, he hit like 400. The second round, I think he was hitting 400 again or something. He was like basically our main guy in the lineup. And, you know, his back was getting a little tight. And the next day we showed up and we heard the Mets basically sent him back and made him come back to New York or Port St. Lucie. And we went to the championship round with basically our – we didn't have our best hitter anymore and our team kind of like was bummed out. And, uh, but I think that's what the Padres need to do is say, Hey, you know, Juan Soto, we want you to do well. We're, we're willing to let you go this and that, but you need to take it a little bit easy. And if we see anything we don't like, you need to come home back to Peoria. So we just need to be watching him because the season's a long season and this is just like a short, you know, two, three week thing. So, um, you know, we just need to basically watch him. So nothing, no, no little injury becomes a huge injury. So we need to have basically a babysitter with that one, knowing that we have a babysitter out there watching his calf and make sure it's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not all that concerned just because it's not like a pivotal part of your body. That is like, you know, make or break for your season. It's the cap yeah, strain. I mean, you run in the outfield unless he's going to be our DH. Yeah. Sure. 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 And like, that's, that's the beauty of, you know, the universal DH now is huge. that guys can, you know, rest up if they have a, a minor little tweak in their body and they can just hit. And for Soto's sake, you know, that's that could be the case here for a little bit. But, you know, the calf is definitely something that you can recover from pretty quickly. It's not, you know, a throwing arm. It's not anything on your upper body. Um, you know, it's not like a groin that lingers. That's that's tough to get over. So I think Bob Melvin's doing the right thing, obviously taking all the precautions and you don't want to lose a guy early in spring. And especially during these meaningless games where he's on fire, it's it's okay for him to you know sit a few games out. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's important that they're taking this precautionary, but it's it's just something that you just don't want to see in June, like pop up out of nowhere, right? Like Soto's calf, now they're going to shut him down for a week or two. And we're going to get into it. The, the Potters are getting a little bit nibbled by the injury bug. We'll get into it later in the show, but I just don't want you know these things to happen. Luckily for the Potters, they have so much star-studded power and depth and their lineup that they should be able to withstand a Juan Soto going down for a few weeks. Let's say we get to that point in the season or one of those four guys going down. Oh, you still got three other ones who are just superstars. Yeah. So uh, yeah. they are able to kind of withstand those injuries. So um, we'll see. But I, I think Heath, you brought up a good point. That's why it's awesome having a former player giving that insight. It's a great David Wright story. Like I never knew about that. And I don't think a lot of people listening would know about that where Listen, the, the Padres take Preston over the WBC, so they, they probably will low-key bring someone there, right, and watch every step he yeah. takes, and if they see something, you're done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's probably what's going to happen. It'll be just some Cognito fan out there. Yeah. So, Nick, <laughs> Nick, I, I, I want to bring this one up to you. you. You wanted this one in our segment and about Ethan Salas, right? Yeah. People are saying top one of the best catching prospects ever. John Heyman brings out a national article, right? John Heyman just drops national articles out of nowhere. He drops one about Ethan Salas, about the San Diego Padres. Tell our viewers, I know a lot of them know, but wh- why do you want to talk so much about Mr. Ethan Salas? Well, I mean, he's the talk of the town right now to a bunch of old baseball writers, and uh, I think it's funny because he's only 16 years old, so you might uh, you might be impressed with this kid. Uh, you know, he's he's flashing a lot of gold in the pan right now, and I, I think – People are saying that he could be a perennial all-star, a guy who can crack this roster at 18, 19 which years old. Which is crazy, yeah. Which, in comparison, there's only been 11, I think, catchers in history of baseball since 1900 
that have had a minimum of 1100 appearances, I think, uh, before the age of 20 or something like that. So like that puts into perspective of how good you have to be to play at a young age at the catching position. Some guys had said that he's a potential hall of famer. Like that's pretty egregious to say at 16 years old, but I mean, this is like the greatest catching prospect of all time. It seems like, so it's, it's awesome that, you know, we are able to hit on the young guys as well as bring in these already established, you know, superstars because look to build the the future that you want the dynasty that you want you need to be stacked on all levels right you gotta you have, have some farm. homegrown guys exactly i mean look we talked about the astros heath i mean the astros half their ball club is homegrown more than half yep. their ball club so you know we got to continue that trend and it speaks volumes that salas decided to come to san diego yes i know that he got the most biggest signing bonus out of an international free agent of all time However, you know, any team was going to go ahead and break the bank on him. He chose San Diego because he really believed in our culture. He yes. likes where we're going. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty absurd. There's a quote from a scout saying, quote, the best amateur catcher I've ever seen, high school or college. He, massive lefty power, plus plus defender. They said he may not even be in the Dominican at 16. They're already, they're already going to put him in Arizona and start putting him in the system at 16 years old, which is just not? absolutely unheard of. And his dad said, listen, that's the team he likes. They seem to be the most exciting team in baseball. And sure, the Potters gave him the most money, but it also means something to someone like him if the Potters are the one reaching out first, right? Back when you're 12, 13 years old and, and there's a team that sees you first, right? There, there's an affinity that comes with that. And I think last note I'd make is, you know, a lot of us were panicking after the Soto trade. Oh my goodness, the Padres farm's depleted. Nine months later, they're already getting all these guys. And nine months from now, they're going to be a top five system again. That's one thing that AJ Preller has always done well. You know, he's had ups, he's had downs, but one thing he's always done well is evaluate and scout town and replenish that system. And it, it helps when you have a guy like Peter Seidler who's bringing out the Brinks trucks, no doubt. But AJ Preller came up in this sport as a scout, not as a general manager. So, um, I'm I'm pumped to watch this kid, especially because it feels like we can never find a catcher. It's kind of like the one hole in this in this franchise. When when's the last quote good Potters catcher? I don't want to knock on anyone, but uh, like Piazza at the end of his career in terms of like who was I don't know. It's been forever. You know, gosh, I mean Nick Hunley was pretty solid, he, he would, but he wasn't like yeah. great. Josh Bard was the same way. Couldn't run, but he could you know get a single that should have been a double. You know, didn't throw anybody out, but yeah. you know, was, he called a great game. It's here's the thing: the Padres have always had catchers that have always focused on calling good games. And yeah, if you get a hit, great. I mean, the last Hedges. best great catcher was probably Alomar, Sally yeah. Alomar Jr. Yeah, yeah. We've never been able to really put a, a catcher that hits like 270, 260 in the lineup. I mean, yeah. we've That's, seen guys that have like flashes of greatness, like Yasmani Grandel definitely had some good seasons. We yeah. had him. We had him. Rene Rivera, Miguel Olivo, like <laughs> you said, you mentioned Josh Bard, you know, um, uh, Hernandez back in the day, Ramon Hernandez. Like, Ramon. there were some guys, but, um, yeah, we've never really had the guy, you know, like there's no like Rio Muto or like Molina or Contreras. So I'm I'm hopeful that Salas can be kind of that staple for San Diego catching we'll so for a long time. Oh my goodness. Well, it it would really be nice to see him play in the States this year and see what he's what he's made of. Yeah. And he actually come over here. It's kind of like all the hoopla. I mean, is he going to get as much as like Bryce Harper did? Because Bryce Harper was a catcher, but they always talked about he was going to be an outfielder. So, but, um, you know, this kid's going to be a catcher. And, you know, Buster Posley went to college and, you know, he kind of like just showed up on the scene. Wasn't like, look at the next great catcher. Yeah. Or looks like, you know, we have the, the next great catcher. So usually Milwaukee, or, uh, Baltimore gets all the great catchers or the East Coast does. But now maybe the West Coast will get one and maybe we'll see him in two years. He also uh, has been taking some notes from Salvador Perez, a, a fellow, Ven fellow Venezuelan. So those are uh, some, yeah, some pretty uh, big shoes to to be getting advice from. Not a bad yeah. guy to take notes from. I want to transition to Fernando Tatis Jr., man. I was uh, The Padres weren't broadcasting the game, but I had some buddies filming it, and you can tell <laughs> everyone was on their feet watching Fernando take his first at bat and feels like forever for the Padres. And, you know how all the whole media is with Fernando. They're going to 
cover and publicly report every step he takes. Oh, Fernando Tati steals his first base from uh, on the second pitch of the at bat. Like it's just it's crazy the kind of publicity he is still kind of the guy in terms of the the magnifying glass, right? The polarizing guy, even though he hasn't been on the big league field in eighteen months. Nick, was it nice just seeing him play again, man? It's nice seeing the pink sleeve in the batter's box, just yeah. the swagger with Fernando. Without a doubt, you know, this is a guy that we've missed sorely for, like you said, 18 months. So hasn't recorded his first official hit yet in, sp in spring training, but it'll come. You know, he's got to work the kinks out. The biggest thing for me, and we were talking about this at the beginning of the show before we hopped on the air, is the defense. We got to tune that stuff up before you <laughs> yeah. know, he can make a make his start. And look, he's got plenty of time, right? Because you got spring and he's got an extra 20 games to to figure it out, you know, taking fly balls and, and doing whatever he needs to do. But Heath, I mean, you brought it up before we started talking here, kind of yeah, catches the ball awkwardly, huh? He catches it. I mean, he, he missed a ball that should have been easily caught. He caught a ball that he just caught it off to the side. You know, it's kind of like this. And I'm just watching his feet footwork. Cause I'm worried about his defense. You know, we all know he can hit, he can run, he's can throw the ball. It's nice to see him swing his swagger there, but it's really about defense. You know, I played with, Hanley Ramirez in Miami was a shortstop. We, they signed me, they signed Jose Reyes. They moved him to short. Mm -hmm. I mean, from short to third Hanley did, that was an all-star shortstop and he didn't play there. He didn't play very, I mean, he tried to hit and hit well. And then he, he um, got traded halfway through the season to um, LA got to play short again. And then all of a sudden his feet was under him. His glove was great again. All of a sudden he got to all these balls and I'm not saying Tatis is doing that, but is Tatis going to take it seriously? Because right field is harder than center field. And, you know, we have, you know, gold glove in center field. If he doesn't hit, maybe we can move Tatis to center. But center is easier. If you're running to left field, the ball is going to go that way. If you're running to right field, the ball is going to go that way. Now, if you're in right field and a lefty hits you to the ball, it's going to go kind of straight. If a righty hits the ball, it's going to tear to the line a little bit. And at Petco, you got that little uh, porch or whatever we got down the line. So he's got to learn a little bit and he's got to learn to read the ball. I mean, at shortstop, the ball was hit in the air. You just kind of looked up and now you, you kind of have to either go back, you got to go forward. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I've also, I also played with Chase Headley. That was one of, you know, good Padre yeah. back in the day, but Third base, he first uh, came up, they moved the him to left field. They yeah. moved him to left field because we had Kevin Kuzman up cool. and he had spent about a year and a half in left field. Well, I remember, pitching staff really didn't like chase playing defense we liked his bat and he got to steal some bases but the problem was he made an error and then all of a sudden any half ball that was kind of coming up short he just let drop mm. where we would be like dude run hard you could have caught that you know so it's one of those things and i'm that's what i'm worried about with tatis i think offense is going to be there i mean we i just don't want him to be a dh i think he can really help i personally think his future could be center field um but, you know, we've got Grisham up there. So it's it's going to be a little juggling act to see what happens. But, you know, Padre fans really pay attention how he reacts to the ball. I really think he needs to be playing every other day in spring just to get his feet wet in the outfield because, you know, what do we have, like 20 games left? Mm -hmm. He can get yeah. 10 to 15 games in. And then he's got, what, about 20 games where he can't play or half a month, let's just say a month. Yeah. He's not going to be able to play. So now what's he going to do? He's just going to read balls off the bat. So let's just see if, you know, he can really react and let's get him, you know, the best thing to do is go out there and play it. Yeah. Know, well, the benefit, the benefit of his uh, suspension is that he can, uh, he did, he can't participate in the WBC. So he's going to be playing every single day in spring training while all those guys are gone. So that's like, that's, so. the, that's the, uh, you'd hope, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, there's there's just a bunch of muscle memory that needs to kick in, honestly. I mean, look, he's played, he's played shortstop his entire career. So there was bound to be some, you know, some kinks here and there. And we experimented. Yeah, exactly. We experimented with the the outfield position with him, um, you know, in 2021. And he didn't look great out there, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. terrible. Yeah, yeah, but, like, they threw him out there mid-season. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. I mean? like, there wasn't a ton of practice in there. He, Heath made me nostalgic when he mentioned Chase Headley. I forgot about his top five MVP finish in 2012. A lot of people forget about that. He wasn't an all-star that year, yet he finished top five in MVP voting. Go figure. Yeah, he had a great, great second half. Go figure. Well, there was, no, there was no other Padre that year, and he really 
put his name on the map that time. So, <laughs> no, anyway. none, nonetheless, the next segment I have titled "Little Little Bit of Wordplay," but it's called "Toto Joe." Joe Musgrove's out for a few weeks. Kettlebell dropped on his big toe. These these El Cajon guys, they 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 had to stop working out with bare feet. Put 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 some shoes on when you go. Heath, did, did you ever work out in flip flops and bare feet? No, I think I did flip flops a couple times as a joke, but I was actually paying attention to what I was doing. But I wasn't really working out. You know, it was more like a joke. But um, I think he was fooling around a little bit. You know, and here's the thing: yes, deadlifters and you know CrossFit, they got to wear barefoot because it's better. This you're a baseball player. Put some freaking shoes on. You know, it, really, maybe we need to get sto- steel toe shoes or some construction guys now. But yeah. here's the thing. I really think, you know, if you're going to work out barefooted, that's fine and all. I I don't know this, but I've been in the locker room. I've been in the weight room. Unless you're doing something stupid, you don't get hurt. If you're If you're not fooling around or doing something like that, you don't get hurt. And so when I heard... Is kept the kettlebell dropped on his toe or he kicked it or whatever it was. I'm like, he there's gotta be some kind of fooling around in there. Yeah. That's I mean, I'm I'm just being honest. There's you go work out, you're paying attention, you're doing what you gotta do. When you're fooling around, that's when mistakes happen. And especially if if you had a shoe and you dropped your the kettlebell, it's still gonna break your toe or it's still gonna hurt your toe or bruise it. Yeah. There's some fooling around and and honestly, no athletes ever be like, well, I was in working out and then I was joking around and you know, I kicked the kettlebell or I dropped it because we were playing catch with it. So <laughs> yeah, so, I, I kind of there's some joke, his... there's some playing around. I the whole story's not there. I hope one of his teammates gives him like a steel toe boot or something. Just just oh, a quick yeah. Nick, gift. Nick, someone commented, I was reading the athletic article of of the injury. Someone said most likely Preller will sign another starter to a 10 year, $200 million contract to cover Musgrove being out a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm with you, Heath. I mean, I think I know a ton of people and look, there's, we all know guys out there who've worked out day in, day out and never had an incident like this. So I imagine that it was a little bit of foolery happening there. Sucks to see because you know obviously he's you now know the time guys, to do it. spring yes, training at least that's what I was gonna now. say that's what I was gonna say like it sucks to see because it's one of your you know top guys in the rotation but could be a lot worse at least it's now you know a couple of weeks hopefully just a couple of weeks and no setbacks but come on Joe they were <laughs> they were gonna give him they were gonna give him the opening day start I had a feeling you know being in front of the hometown and so you know Bob Melvin said they're gonna shut him down for a few weeks you know what does that mean is is it gonna be three four weeks is it gonna be six seven weeks we'll have to we'll have to find out but thank goodness for the Michael Walker signings and all those other signings now right now it yeah. makes you feel a little bit better Heath does it matter what toe like in terms of pitching I mean the toe that would be the worst is your right foot so like the, the toe that's toe. on the rubber, toe that's on the yeah. rubber, yeah. Because that's the one you kind of drag, or you can. Some pitchers, when they push, they kind of hit their toe down. Some guys drag their toe, right. so that's probably the worst toe to really hit your big toe on your your uh, your um the, near the rubber. So your right foot, if you're right handed, mm-hmm. left foot if you're left handed. But it, honestly, if it was your step and toe, that doesn't matter. Two step and toe. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Two step. Let's so, uh, let's anyway. let's wrap it up. We got two more. Let's rapid fire these two segments. I want to uh, second to last. David Dahl, uh, a player that the Padres had brought on, formerly a Colorado Rocky, an All Star back in 2019. A lot of people didn't think much of the move, but you know, Nick, I know you you're kind of our spring training strat, stats guy. He's having a really really good spring. One of my buddies who went to a game said he hit a three run bomb that was about 470 feet. Um, this team is not going to have as many outfielders with. Tatis being suspended, a Zocar having some question marks. I think there was, you know, a question: Will David Dahl make the team? And now it seems like can yeah. this guy be starting in the corner uh, until until Tatis gets back? So, what are your initial thoughts on his superb spring training thus far? It, to me, he's the opening day right fielder. Yeah. Right fielder. I, I mean, you signed the guy for a reason. I think they understood that that's why he was going to be on this team. Look, I was excited when they signed him because when he was in Colorado, he had flashes of greatness. He's a top there. prospect. Yeah, top prospect for them. You know, and when he came up, he. He played some pretty good games against us when we when we got to play him in Colorado. But you know he's still really young. I think what 20, 28, 29 years old. Um, you know I think he's got a lot to prove still, a lot left in the tank. Former first round pick. Um, it's a guy that you could take a wild card on because you know at the end of the day he's minor league contract. So if it doesn't work out, you know it's not a big hit for you. But it seems like he's doing well in spring training. You know he's got a lot of pop here. 
Um, you know, that one home run he's got, I think he has a triple as he's well. He's jacked. I mean, plays, yeah, he's jacked. He plays good defense. So I'm all about it for him to be our opening day right fielder. And then whenever Tatis comes back, you know, maybe ease Tatis in and out of the the uh, the defense while he, you know, he DHs here and there. And then let's see if he can just become a good bench piece, you know, just giving these guys days off when they need it. He, he, you know, I believe I, I agree everything with what you're saying, but what I really see is remember Juan Cruz. Mm -hmm. Yep. We had him for like half a year and then released him. I think David's kind of a first half player. I think the second half he kind of drops off. He's a young guy. So it still has time to, you know, prove that he could play in the second half, but we need somebody in the first half. And I think maybe he's a platoon part-time guy, you know, start off first month plays for us and then, is that part-time guy and then actually has great numbers because he always shows slight, you know, greatness here and there, but he can't just sustain it all season long and we don't need it all season long. We just need a little bit here, a little bit there. So I like the signing so far, you know, really, I, I think it's going to be a good thing for us so far. Yeah. hundred percent. Last but not least, WBC. Next time we'll be talking, the games will have already began beginning March 7th. Obviously, the Potters are headlines. A ton of guys now. Nick Martinez is going to be participating for Team USA. Of course, Manny Machado, uh, Juan Soto, Dominican. We have so many guys. I mean, to Bill Chrisman for Colombia, Bogart. A great video of you, Darvish, hanging out with Otani today. Uh huh. <laughs> I, 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 I hope I hope Shohei's teaching you how to throw that splitter, man. Um, yeah. But uh, are you guys going to be watching this thing? I mean, who who do you have winning it all, Nick? Oh, I'm definitely going to be watching it. I honestly put my money at BetOnline.ag. So go ahead and. Place your wagers there if you need to make a, a a pick on the WWC WBC champion on Venezuela. I think that they've got a nice team, uh, really under the radar. I think MLB ranks them as like the top six team, I think, in in the power rankings. But look, they've got some really good pitchers. They've got good hitters. Um, you know, I think it's a sneaky team with good value. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see. I mean, look, the Dominican roster stacked, the U.S. roster stacked, of course, but. You know, I think it's going to be fun to watch. Heath, you've played in a couple of WBCs, correct? Yeah, I've been playing in two of them. I've, were, I've picked the USA team. What was that? You were, you were on the first inaugural USA team or no? No, I was on the second and the third. Got it. What was that like? Yep. I mean, does it mean a lot to, to the players or is it more it, just kind of like spring training still? It means a lot to the players because you're representing your country. It's almost like being in the Olympics for baseball and – you just get so much pride and you know what, what the biggest knock is when like a team takes their player back for whatever reason, or, you know, sometimes they take them back because they want them to pitch more, you know, and you're like, Whoa, what, what just happened? Why is it so-and-so? But yeah, you right. understand why, but you feel like a sense of pride to go out there and give it your all. And, and you're not even a hundred percent and you want to go give it your all and you want to do really well. And so it's, um, it's just a great time. It really is. It's like the Olympics. That's the best way I can exp ex explain it. You just have this sense of pride. I, this year, I'm going to pick the U.S. team like I do every year. But Venezuela is really good. So is the Dominican. But I think they're a little full of themselves. And ever since everybody's picking, usually what happens is if everybody picks a, a Latin team, they get really full of themselves. And they don't perform as good as they want to because they're like kind of showboating a little too much. And I think U S really is going to nitty gritty, but you never know Japan, Korea. They yeah. always surprise everybody. I like South Korea. Right there. I, I thought Kim, South Korea. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe Tommy, Kim will Tommy be Edmund. the, you know, I'm, I'm excited because every WBC is getting better and better and better. And the coverage is getting better. It's and, becoming bigger. You feel it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and it's exciting. You know, Tommy Edmund, another guy going to be playing for South Korea. I think that's a yeah. sneaky, sneaky team. People aren't talking about, but I love your Venezuela pick. That's a really good team. You know, people forget Ronald Acuna and so many other guys, a lot of those Astros starting pitchers. So, uh, um, yeah, Perez, I, I, uh, I think when I looked at just like the lines when it comes to like what the uh, the betting odds were, I just saw Venezuela as the best odds in my opinion. South Korea had pretty good odds as well. I love Tommy Edmund. He came out and said he's excited to play with Hasa Kim. Yeah. So that, that means a lot. Yeah, it should be a, a really, really good tournament. I cannot wait. I'm going to be locked in. And then we got opening day. We have made it to March. It is opening day month. And opening uh month, baby. Let's do it, guys. Let's do it, guys. Thank you so much for listening, watching. Ring the bell. Make sure you go check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your listen. Give us a review. Give us a rating. That's subscribe, Heath Bell. Subscribe, subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> That's Heath Bell. That's Nick Kreider. Sporn and Azari, everyone. Signing out. Let's go. Go pods.